This is Inside Story, the only show about the system by people who lived it. I'm Lawrence Bartley. Tickets, get your tickets here. Easy to forget that you're inside a prison, but every once in a while, like, you get reminded. Even though that does exist, that secret blue code, you're part of that shit show if you allow it. You will remember the day you went inside the institution and the day you will be leaving. The time in between, make yourself sharp. For people who've never been incarcerated, asking someone who has is generally the best way to get an idea of what prison life is like. But some people take a different approach. Prison tourism is a collection of museums and experiences that could give a very skewed idea of how the justice system works and who it's for. haunted house in, in Philadelphia, probably the most famous in the region, and it's at an old prison. It's a museum, and every Halloween at night, it gets turned into this absolute horror show. Tickets! Oh, I'm terrified. Get your tickets here! All right. Each fall, thousands of tourists from across the country stumble through Eastern State Penitentiary, a former prison, looking for a scare. I hope you're all ready. It's like easy to forget that you're inside a prison, but every once in a while, like you get reminded. There's like the guard towers up there. They've got like the spotlights, like a searchlight, like someone's escaping. The industry of parading spooked tourists through former and even current prisons is a phenomenon that spans the country. Tourists unabashedly posting their prison escapades across social media. Take pictures, go into cells, you know, lock other people in cells, kind of play around. Small tours, like the old jail in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, boast upwards of 25,000 ghost hunters a year. I put the flash on and it was like orbs. You see it? Oh, there was like flash. See them? Oh my gosh. Uh, it's just like you can tell there was some bad things that happened here. Obviously there's men hanged. It's just a very kind of unsettling feeling when you're here by yourself. Larger sites, like the former federal penitentiary of Alcatraz in San Francisco, sees over 1.5 million visitors a year. It's a form of dark tourism that's raising red flags with the criminal justice reform movement. Prison tourism is a phenomenon that really goes hand in hand with mass incarceration. Why do you think people are attracted to go visit prisons? It's a spectacle of human suffering and violence and all the kind of things that attract Americans about crime more generally. So like even with the best intentions, do you think it's ever okay to have like, a haunted house in a place like a prison? No, honestly, I don't. To me, if you think about proposing a haunted house in a Holocaust museum, for example, it's inconceivable. And it's inconceivable because it's a site of human suffering. Oftentimes, we don't talk about the politics, the political conditions, the historical conditions, the economic conditions into which people were, were uh, ushered into the space in the first place. Eastern State Penitentiary was among the first to try and address some of the criticism. Last year, they swapped their long-running Terror Behind the Walls theme for a more neutral Halloween Nights. And the prison museum now employs formerly incarcerated people as tour guides and advisors. Are you guys from Philadelphia? No. No? Visiting? New Jersey? Where were you guys? Oh, Virginia. Welcome to Philly. Ryan Serrano Hall is now one of the many formerly incarcerated people working at the prison museum. I lost all my 20s to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. What do you think of, like, the Halloween stuff? Like, 
the haunted house, like having that be part of what this museum does. I don't know how many people are interested in like learning about the prison system. It's not a popular topic. It's a very hard conversation to have with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So it's an entryway. I wonder, like, the place that you were incarcerated at, mm -hmm. if they were to have, like, tourism or, like, a... No, no a, way. Like, a, a haunted house. Like, what would you feel about that? They would. It's not possible. It's not possible. It's not possible. I mean, yeah, it'd be a scary place to visit, for sure. They, it would work, then, if it, they're doing it for a haunted house. If you wanted to do a haunted house in a federal... Yeah. It, yeah, it's a scary place to go, then. You don't even need decorations. Over the last decade, Eastern State began using its old prison to discuss the disparities in today's modern prison system. Exhibits across the grounds now address mass incarceration and the disproportionate numbers of black and brown Americans behind bars. These are the racial disparities in our prison population in 1970. Huh. What you see is that the policies that we've passed in the last 40 years have particularly impacted black and Latino communities. And so this is like people come up for the the haunted house, mm -hmm. they get scared, and they they have to contend with this. They, they will walk right past every person who comes in that direction, and you'll see there's always a group of people gathered around. Sean Kelly is in charge of balancing the museum's educational content with the theatrics of the Halloween haunted house, their largest fundraiser. No other generation of Americans has ever put this many people in prison. No other nation in the world is doing it now. So even with something like Halloween, we use that as a way to reach out to new audiences and to say, just take a look at the pattern across US history and just notice how different this moment is than any, pre any moment that has preceded it. Well, what do you say to critics who would say, even if you're bringing people in to engage them, mm -hmm. it's still a fundamentally in bad taste way of doing it. It's, it's inappropriate. We are comfortable with where we landed after a lot of deep conversation, a lot of studies of how people are reacting to the, to the site, what the takeaway messages are. And it's certainly not for everybody, but we think that we're doing far more good than we're doing harm. You make monsters go into the prison, like you put monsters in the prison itself. Come here! And so for the average viewer, you know, the person who's coming to get a fright, it unconsciously says to them, yeah, monsters are here. I don't think that's what people are thinking. We think that the audience understands that we undercut the prison architecture and certainly don't recreate any of the, the stereotypes of what you would expect to see inside of a prison. If the museum didn't need the money that the haunted house like gives you guys, mm -hmm. would you still do the haunted house? Yeah, I would say yes, because of the volume of people that we're able to reach. I hear you that there's something that may feel off about people enjoying themselves, but I think that the trade-off is absolutely worth it to bring that many more people into the conversation because I don't see it happening other places. Two years. Three decades. Nine years for murders he did not commit. There's a growing movement to ensure that people wrongly convicted of crimes get compensated for their time in prison. In the last three decades, more than 3,000 people have been exonerated. Black people are much more likely than whites to be wrongly convicted of murder. But still, in 12 states, if you serve time for a crime you didn't commit, the state won't give you a dime. Legal experts warn that with Roe v. Wade overturned, women who have miscarriages or stillbirths could face more child neglect or manslaughter charges. That's because it's now easier for states to pass laws that give fetuses the same rights as the women carrying them, which some states have done already. Last year, the FBI changed how it collects crime data and asked police departments to do the same, but some of them never did. That's left the FBI without data from departments serving a third of the population, including the country's biggest departments in New York and Los Angeles, meaning the FBI doesn't know if crime is increasing, decreasing, or staying the same. Cops aren't exactly known for speaking out, but two detectives from Baltimore, Dre and Big H, started a podcast to do exactly that. I want to say thank you for coming on because it's, it's not 
often that someone like me, who's formerly incarcerated, get Baltimore police officers to come on the show to talk real. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Why was it important that you created your podcast, The Silverback Chronicles? We just got tired of um, people saying, you know, the black, the black cloud around policing. And I get it. I do get it because a lot of officers do it to themselves and they create that. But we want to change that entire narrative because we're phenomenal men, we're phenomenal detectives, we have fun. And every altercation we came with amongst people in the streets, it, it, not even altercation, but coming into contact with somebody, it always resulted in us dapping each other, laughing, talking. Y'all, I didn't know police was like y'all. I never knew y'all existed. All the time. All the time. Doesn't matter where we go, it's always love. Now, you two speak openly in the media. So what do folks on the force think about you two being so transparent? You look at the website, it says that they're transparent. So we're transparent. We are transparent. We also speak from our intellectual property. We're not speaking from the department or of the department. It just so happens that that's what we do during As the day. As a profession, day. yeah. And we're not saying anything negative. We're just, we're trying to spread more positivity. We're trying to spread doing well, things the right way and respect. Absolutely. And that's actually, that's promoting the department. That's promoting great policing. We're actually doing community service just on a different platform. No pushback from anybody. We hear it, but they don't, you know, we, we don't see it. Because they respect the silverback? That's Absolutely, what all day, every day. So switching gears a bit, how do you handle interrogations? Interrogations, I mean, that's, a, that's an art. You that's know? an art. The tactics that we used back in the day, I can't talk on it, because I, I wasn't in that room, and every case by case is different. But what I will say is that now the technology, having cameras, you know, it has leveled out the, the, the playing field. So is it true that interrogations are crucial during the first 48 hours when a crime happened? Do they teach y'all that? Um, or is that just TV? Uh, you know, every department is different. But it is crucial because the events that occurred are much more fresher. In those cases, when it involves a police officer, I'm told that they're not to be interrogated until hours, sometimes days later, when they have the attorney present and they get a chance to, and during that period, as y'all established, is crucial. It's the same as when you um, grab a suspect. If he invokes his right to speak and waits for his attorney, we can't interrogate. Well, I mean, but does that happen? I remember when I, but, well, when I was arrested, right. I said I want a right to remain silent. They said, yeah, hi, right. you gonna get your ass in there and I'm a right wow. to whoop your mother. Yeah, that policing culture has it up. It's it up for everybody. For everybody else. Because there's always an old school police culture. There's always an old school business that people just were under and they followed. And that was just how things were done. And that's it is horrible. It really is horrible. We're, sorry, even today, we're sorry that you went through that. Yeah, hell yeah. You know? Thank you. That's Appreciate ridiculous. It's tough to hear, but Appreciate that. You know, that 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 behavior has ruined it for like th that behavior is the reason why we're in right now. But even even today, I see that some, in some instances it's still not fair because the interrogations don't happen for police officers in the same way it happens for civilians. Yeah, and I, I think they are, you know, getting better with that because, um, man, police reform has been huge in the last five to six years, and that's every department. Like, they have to, even federally. Let's say a person gets arrested for a battery or whatever, but then a person is calling you all as a witness to say, Officer um, John Doe kicked me in my face. Would you all come and say, yo, listen, he kicked him in his face? Well, nine times out of 10, body-worn cameras record everything nowadays. Right. But in the cases that there's not body cameras. Oh, yeah, if, if the officer did it, of course. Of course. How would that make you, how would the culture be for you? Would you be ostracized no, in the department? No, you can't be ostracized. Yeah. No. Even though that does exist. Right. That secret blue code, no. Because you're a liability. You're part of that, you're part of that shit show if you allow it and right. turn a blind eye to it. And that's why there's bad police coaches worldwide. When we were in the Northeast, we always checked each other. Even when things got a little bit too hot, you know, H will pull me to the side like, Dre, you're out of line. And also the police officer has to be able to take that. How do you get the whole department to garner that same kind of respect when a situation like Freddie Gray happens and no one gets held accountable? Individuals. Individuals. I mean, I will say that our department, the people that work the streets, the best people out there.
But for everybody to be on the same page, you know, it's leadership, it's it's brass. Yeah. Everybody has to want to do that. that you know mission. what I mean? That mission. So what's the one thing you wish the community knew about policing? We're human just like them. We take this job serious and we're really here to protect them. I would like for them to know that we're really here to help. We would love to see less men of color getting killed, you know? Wow. And we don't want to see, we don't like to see bodies on the ground. Like, we go home and have, have nightmares about that. Well, thank you, fellas, for coming out and for talking with me and for definitely keeping it real. You know, Baltimore PD's finest in the building. I appreciate that. Now we appreciate us. you. means everything. Tyra Patterson spent more than two decades in prison before her case was overturned by the governor. Now she's fighting for a full pardon and doing some pretty great things. There you go. Come on. There you go. Go, go. Yeah. You got this. Tyra, you got it, baby. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Way to finish out. Way to finish out. My name is Tyra Patterson. I was wrongfully incarcerated for 23 years. I love boxing. It's hard. You got to stick with it. It's like you have to focus. You have to focus. And I think boxing is a good fit because I fight the world, right? I, I fought to come home for so many years. Now I'm fighting for our clients. OJPC stands for Ohio Justice and Policy Center. And what we do there is quite the opposite of the Innocence Project. We only represent those who have made mistakes. And I always say humanity should not and cannot wait for freedom. And that's what we do. We humanize those who have made mistakes. Everything happened when I was 18. I had made a false confession just to go home and that's what I thought was going to happen. I was young, I was scared, and I was also illiterate. I dropped out of school when I was 11 years old because my family and I experienced chronic homelessness, but I had to learn how to read to be able to fight. And my Bunky, who is now my best friend, Amanda, encouraged me to go to school. And I said, but I'm embarrassed, I'm embarrassed to go over there because I know I, I'm not educated. She was, and she said, I'll never forget, be embarrassed if you don't do something about it. And she would sit up at night with me and teach me what a sentence was, what a comma was, where I had my periods, um, and it motivated me. So I made prison my education. While I was inside a prison, I kept writing attorneys and TV shows or whomever would listen to my story. And I wrote Ohio Justice and Policy Center and David Singleton, who is my colleague, but also my attorney, came to visit with me to tell me he's not gonna take my case because it's a wrongful conviction and that's not what we do. However, he investigated, looked into it a lot more, and became interested and told me that he will be helping me. In fact, he became my leading attorney. Since I've been home, I am embedded in the arts community because I want to continue to educate people about social justice through art, and, that, and it's the perfect way to do it. Artworks gave me an opportunity when I came home. I, came, I went to them and because I noticed that, that we didn't have any social justice murals and right away they gave me that opportunity and I created and designed our first social justice piece. The mural depicts five women who works in the social justice field and have been overlooked. So when we talk about mass incarceration, the focal point is always with men. However, since 1980, our women's population have increased 750%. So I wanted to focus on women 
who have made mistakes. I am involved in the arts community and um, the law firm, I work there, but I'm also a teacher. Like I said, I dropped out of school when I was 11 years old. So this has come full circle for me. I was hired by the Ohio Board of Education and now I am over three schools. And it's exciting. It's like when I go in there, it's my moment with them kids. I want to be that one teacher that never forget as someone forgot about me. So it's, it's the highlight of my day. What would I say to my comrades? As a former lifer who was sentenced to 43 years to life, you will remember two days. That is the day you went inside the institution and the day you will be leaving. The time in between, make yourself sharp. Do your time in a constructive manner because it matters. People are champions for us and they want to see us win. However, you have to be your own best advocate. You have to start now because you will come home. It might surprise you that a show that's by and for incarcerated people will give you the perspective of law enforcement. I remember correctional staff I got to know during my 27 years in prison. And some of them, let's face it, hated my guts. And I didn't like them much either. But a few really cared about making the prison a better and safer place for everyone. There was this one superintendent known as a warden I worked with regularly to improve the facility's culture. Sometimes my peers and I would share ideas with him that we thought would make incarcerated lives easier, and in turn, he would share ideas with us that he thought would improve correctional lives. It was imperfect, but we were able to have some real heart-to-hearts with no filters. You see, a prison is like a machine that changes slowly, if at all, but once you realize that inside those walls, everyone is just a human being trying to make it, you can get a lot more done. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.